Okay, I wanted to do a brief video on just introducing my corn breeding projects. Uh, I think corn is a really amazing crop and more people should grow their own corn and eat it and learn how to use it properly. Um, I think there's no other grain crop that yields as well and yields as much food and can is as adaptable to as many different places as maize. I'm gonna just go over my project and some recommendations for people who might be interested in doing some of their own amateur breeding. Yeah, so let's just look. Obviously I have three corn boards here and they represent two of my ongoing corn breeding projects, which I basically have two constantly changing corn breeding projects. Um, on the left here, you see I have two boards of mostly white corn, and that's my flower corn project. And then over here on the right, we have a large corn board that uh, represents my orange flint project. I would not call them varieties. They are a genetically diverse collection of crossed and segregating material that someday I hope to turn into something resembling a variety. But right now, both of these are mixtures of a whole bunch of different stuff and I am trying to select them into a direction it's almost like performance art, you know? You start with something and it changes and you have some amount of control over what it changes into, but not, not an immense amount of control. But I think that's sort, sort of the, the beauty of it, really. I mean, things happen inside the corn as the genes recombine and segregate. This is flint corn here, my yellow, corn, my orange corn, is a primarily a flint and I am trying to get it as flinty and as orange as possible. Primarily based on two major components, one being northern eight-row flint. Uh, I use several eight-row flint varieties, the biggest one being Carol Deppie's Cascade Flints, which I will discuss hopefully in some other video. Um, that was one of the backbone early varieties I started with. I also started with a variety called Bronze Beauty Flint, which I got from the USDA, which is a uh, very interesting flint, which I am trying to breed out a lot of characteristics out of my corn because I decided to go in a different direction. Um, but it's a very interesting corn, a Ho-Chunk corn from Wisconsin and uh, the Great Lakes region, sort of started redoing Carol Deppie's breeding work with her Cascade series. I used Roy's Calais and Byron Yellow to um, recombine with the Cascade series because at the time I was concerned that she had selected it too hard for conditions in the Pacific Northwest. I'm here in the mid-Atlantic. I don't know how true that was, but um, in any case, I've taken it very far from the Cascade series at this point uh, because the other very major component of this flint is um, South American Cateto Solino which um, I don't have any pure Cateto Solino in here but if you look at this ear this is somewhat characteristic of what a typical ear of Cateto Solino might look like it is a uh, very hard, very dark orange, high, high carotene, small eared, mini road flint corn from coastal South America, uh, northern coastal Argentina, southern coastal uh, Brazil, and then into Uruguay and Paraguay. Um, uh, this one has, looks like, uh, one, two, three, four, five, 
six, this looks like a 12 row corn. I've had Cateto with as many as 24 rows um, when I was planting it directly. Cateto is an interesting corn. It tends to be small, but the biggest, most interesting fact about Cateto is it has genetics that hot, super concentrate the carotene levels in the corn. And so that's something I'm very interested in, in creating a very flinty, very disease resistant, early season flint corn with as dark orange red, super high uh, carotene levels. That's, that's my dream. Starting with my original flint, I crossed in uh, Cateto Sulin. And then I also crossed in Caribbean flint, which is sort of this, this row here down to the end and then it wraps around. Um, so that's sort of the line that is mainly Caribbean. That's a very promising flint. Um, those are very promising corns. Now the chickens are coming over to see if they can steal some of this corn. Um, if I'm not looking, look, there she this is. This is um, derived from Cargill North Temperate Zone Cusco. Uh, I don't have very much of this. I'm not 100% sure that it is a useful introgression into the, the corn. Peruvian corn is really interesting and exotic and one of the reasons I wanted to, or Andean corn, I'm sorry, um, I wanted to include it is because of its very unusual characteristics and hopefully um, useful increase in genetically diverse uh, characteristics, not all of which can be seen, most of which are invisible, but uh, you know, just to broaden the genetic base of my corn, that's what the Cusco is in there this for. This is um, Mexident, which is not Cargill um, Mexican Dent. This is a uh, mixture of a variety cre created by Frank Kutka. This is an excellent corn. Um, this is uh, a very, very interesting corn. He crossed a bunch of uh, highly adapted, short season, high yielding corn belt dent lines, inbred lines with uh, Mexican, uh, I think it was uh, Caca Huacintle, but it might have been uh, Chalqueño. Um, I have to go back and read my notes. I always get those two kind of confused in my head, although they're very different corns. In a tortilla, when you nixtamalize the Mexican dent, the Mexican, I'm sorry, it is, it has an astoundingly rich flavor, nixtamalized in a tortilla or in a tamale. Um, just the most outstanding flavor. And I, I, and I am not like a person who's like really has a capacity for a nuanced palate, you know, but that is just a really amazing corn and very worth growing. Um, I'm just trying to make it way more orange and not denty, but flinty, you know, but I'm hoping that I can capture that flavor. Okay, so that's the flint, more or less. So this is the flower corn project. And um, so I have, this is my original flower corn mixed with um, Cargill Caribbean. This is also Caribbean. This is Cargill Tuspeño, or I'm sorry, Mexican Dent over here. This is Caroico. This is Sch Schroeder Strain Hickory King from South Africa. Let me talk a little bit about my flower corn. If you're wanting to grow flower corn, are the complex of corns called Iroquois white flower uh, or Six Nations white flower, and then there's also individual selections from each tribe. It's also very commonly known as Tuscarora white flower, and that's an eight row white flower corn, very long eared in some cases. The Tuscarora strains in particular are very large, and the Cherokee, there's also strains from other tribes. The Cherokee have a very similar corn called Cherokee white flower, um, but there's most of the eastern, northeastern corn growing tribes had a version of this eight road white flower corn and it was a very important popular corn. And my flower corn is primarily based on a number of strains of the, from the Haudenosaunee and Cherokee peoples. Um, 
but I have added in a bunch of other stuff. And I am not, originally I wanted to create a look-alike corn that had some improvements in my own mind that were uh, to correct some of the deficiencies that I found in growing the Haudenosaunee strains. And I was going to create an eight row white flower corn that was very similar, but uh, had, um, well, a couple of things that I felt were wrong with those corns. But then after a few years of growing it and, and like doing more research and thinking about it, I realized, well, that's kind of disrespectful because those corns in particular, the Native American strains that are still grown by some of those, some of the uh, Northeastern uh, Native American tribes are, you know, very important parts of their culture and they are, you know, sacred. And so I would not want to create a strain that was visually indistinguishable or difficult to distinguish, you know, given that I am changing the corn. The white corn I want sort of nutritionally, uh, what I'm looking for is very high protein, uh, high yield, high protein, and good disease resistance, and very, very flowery starch. So that one I want as hard and flinty, and this one I want as soft and flowery as I can get. So they're, and they're very, very different. Yeah, so this has been kind of long and rambling, and uh, I'm not sure that I even covered everything I wanted to cover, but it's just a, you know, hopefully brief introduction to, uh, my corn breeding projects and I will go into other aspects of this project as we go along. Um, Tra-la-la. So I'd like also to point out that this corn was grown in 2016 and there was no fertility added to the field before growing the corn. Um, it was only cultivated once and then we experienced the worst drought in living memory. Um, and the corn, that's part of the reason why you're seeing all of these unfilled tips, that's a sign of drought. Uh, the lit last tat silks to pollinate are the tip silks. And so if the conditions are water stressed, you typically get unfilled tips. And you can see we have a whole lot of unfilled tips. But we grew a lot of corn. I mean, we are eating a lot of tortillas. Um, and this is just my... These are just my seed boards. Um, this is not the corn I'm going to eat.